Well, very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome. Good Friday evening to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us today for China and the Maritime Silk Road Symposium webinar. Now, first, the webinar is organized by the Asian Civilizations Museum Singapore with support from the Ministry of Church, Community and Youth Singapore. My name is Lester Leo. It's my pleasure to be your MC for this three-day symposium. Now, the China and the Maritime Silk Road Symposium webinar is held in conjunction with the Tang Shipwreck Collection Exhibition at Shanghai Museum from the 15th of September 2020 to the 10th of January 2021. Now, this webinar helps bring together leading international scholars, curators, and archaeologists to discuss the most up-to-date research and findings about China and the Maritime Silk Road. In each of the sessions, the speakers will give brief presentations on their research, followed by a panel discussion and a Q&A session with the audience, all of you logging in. Now, today we are pleased to have with us Mr. Kenny Ting of Asian Organizations Museum and the Peranakan Museum, Group Director of Museums, National Heritage Board Singapore, to start off with the opening address, followed by a welcome address by Mr. Teo Chi Hien, Senior Minister and Coordinating Minister for National Security, and lastly, a keynote lecture by Dr. Tenson Sen, together with Dr. Stephen Murphy, to start off this webinar. So ladies and gentlemen, I now have the pleasure of inviting Mr. Kenny Ting. He's the Director of Asian Civilizations Museum and the Peranakan Museum, Group Director of Museums at the National Heritage Board. As Director, he has overseen the shift in the museum's curatorial approach from a geographical focus to a thematic cross-cultural focus and from an ethnographic focus to a focus on decorative arts. He has helmed recent exhibitions on the arts of Myanmar, Korea, Angkor, and Java on the material culture of cosmopolitan Asian port cities and on contemporary Chinese couture also. He is interested in the history of travel and the heritage of Asian port cities and is the author of the books The Romance of the Grand Tour, 100 Years of Travel in Southeast Asia and Singapore 1819, A Living Legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome Mr. Kenny Ting. Senior Minister and Coordinating Minister for National Security, Mr. Teo Chi Hien, uh, Dr. Tan Sen Sen, Director, Center for Global Asia, New York University, Shanghai, and Global Network Professor of New York University. Dr. Yang Zhigang, Director of the Shanghai Museum. Mr. Lo Lik Ping, Chairman of the Asian Civilizations Museum. Ms. Chang Kuini, CEO of the National Heritage Board, Singapore, Distinguished speakers, colleagues, friends, ladies, and gentlemen, welcome to Asian Civilizations Museum's International Webinar Symposium, China and the Maritime Silk Road, Shipwrecks, Ports, and Products. The topics of discussion for this weekend's symposium further themes that ACM explores in its permanent galleries and its exhibitions. In particular, the history of maritime trade in Asia and its legacy today. Asian export art as a genre of art and its associated art history, the hybrid material culture of Asian port cities, and the opportunities and challenges inherent in maritime archaeology as an avenue of academic research and as a profession in the Asian region. This symposium is also a curtain raiser for an important exhibition collaboration between ACM and the Shanghai Museum. On September 15th this year, uh, the exhibition, The Baoli Era, Treasures from the Tang Shipwreck Collection, will open at the Shanghai Museum and run till January 2021. This collaboration has been at least three years in the making, and I'm happy that it's finally coming to fruition, notwithstanding the logistical challenges of undertaking international exhibition exchanges during a pandemic. Shanghai Museum and ACM have had long-standing and very warm ties that were established more than 20 years ago in ACM's earliest years. I'm very pleased that our ties remain strong and I'm looking forward to viewing the exhibition in Shanghai virtually. For this symposium to happen at all, I would like to thank the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth, in particular, Mr. Timothy Chin and his team at the Arts and Heritage Division for their generous funding and support. A very big thank you goes to Senior Minister Tio for agreeing to grace our symposium with a welcome address and for always keeping ACM in your thoughts. 
Uh, big thanks to all of the speakers for the symposium for agreeing to take part, even though some of you are in time zones requiring early morning starts. Finally, I'd like to thank and congratulate my colleague, Dr. Stephen Murphy and the ACM curatorial and research team for making this symposium happen despite all. I'm looking forward to a very engaging and energetic symposium this evening and this weekend. So thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Kenny Ping. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it now gives me great pleasure that I invite Mr. Teo Chi Hien, Senior Minister and Coordinating Minister for National Security for his welcome address. SM Teo, please. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to join all of you uh, during, for this webinar. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was at the exhibition yesterday with, uh, my, with a colleague of mine from the People's Republic of China, State Council, Councillor Yang Jie Chi, uh, who was visiting in Singapore. And I think he enjoyed visiting the exhibition and we had a very nice lunch there. So we hope to, to invite all of you to come and join us uh, to actually physically be present at the ACM uh, on a future occasion when travel is allowed. Uh, Dr. Tan Sen Sen, uh, Director, Center for Global Asia, New York University, Shanghai, and Global Network Professor of New York University. Dr. Yang Zhi Kang, uh, Director of the Shanghai Museum. Mr. Lo Lik Peng, uh, Chairman of the Asian Civilizations Museum. Ms. Chang Hui Ni, Chief Executive Officer of the National Heritage Board of Singapore. Uh, Mr. Kenny Ting, Director, Asian Civilizations Museum. Distinguished guests, scholars, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to join you this evening for the opening of the China and the Maritime Silk Road Shipwrecks, Ports and Products Conference, organized in conjunction with the upcoming exhibition. The exhibition is the Bao Li era treasures from the Tang Shipwreck Collection, which will be held at the Shanghai Museum in September this year. When COVID-19 affected the world earlier this year, the Asian Civilizations Museum made the decision to move this conference into the digital space. The digital format of this conference is now part of our new normal. The rise of video conferencing and other new ways of connecting each other is an example of how human history is rooted in finding ways to continue to interact between peoples, societies, and civilizations in spite of the obstacles and the challenges that we may face. It is when interactions take place with open exchanges of trade, goods, goods, culture, ideas, and people that human civilization as a whole advances. The digital format of this conference also enables the ACM to reach out to an even wider audience across many borders and allows all speakers and participants to participate conveniently, actively, and safely. ACM had already been working with the Chinese counterparts on two key exhibitions for this year before COVID-19, namely the Tang Shipwreck Collection Exhibition at Shanghai Museum, which this conference is a prelude to, and the Yongle Wanli, Empress of the Ming Exhibition in November at ACM, which will feature loans from the Palace Museum in Beijing. I'm glad that despite the challenges, ACM and its counterparts have made efforts to carry on with these two exhibitions within the current restrictions, as it is important to continue our cross-cultural exchanges and collaborations. The Tang Shipwreck Collection exhibition at Shanghai Museum is the first time that this collection is being shown in China. This is particularly significant as the collection is a tangible demonstration of the long-standing historical links between China, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East, which continue to flourish today. The two exhibitions will also commemorate the 30th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Singapore and China this year. They showcase the historical breadth and depth of our bilateral relationship, which continues to grow from strength to strength with each generation. The Tang Shipwreck Collection 
gives us a sense of the history of past eras and allows us to better appreciate the links that have connected civilizations through the ages. This is especially important in an increasingly interconnected world and which offers much promise. But in a world where, unfortunately, isolationist sentiments in many countries can also be amplified. So it's all the more important that we continue to reach out to each other and strengthen the interconnections that we have. The collection contains more than 60,000 ceramics as well as luxurious objects of gold and silver. They paint a picture of the rich economic, cultural, and people-to-people -people exchanges that connected civilizations since at least the ninth century. Along the sea route running from the Middle East to India, Southeast Asia, and China, more popularly known as the Maritime Silk Route. The discovery of the Tang shipwreck with its artifacts confirmed Overland routes were not the only trade connections between East and West, and that Southeast Asia lay at the heart of a well-used global maritime trading network. One of the artifacts that will be exhibited at Shanghai Museum later this year is a blue and white decorated dish. Although it is produced in China, the dish was decorated with brilliant blue cobalt glaze which was mined in Iran and unavailable in China at that time. The dish also features a lozenge motif with flowers or leaves at the corners, which was a design favored in the Middle East. It was likely that the vessel was found for present day Iraq and Iran before it was unfortunately shipwrecked near Belitung Island, not far from Singapore in Southeast Asian waters. The vessel was an Arab dhow made of timber sewn together, a typical construction method of vessels from the Persian Gulf, with wood from Africa. But the repairs were made with materials native to India and Southeast Asia. The Tang shipwreck collection will provide a window into what the world was like more than a thousand years ago. The artifacts, along with historical and archaeological records exhibited, will allow audiences to appreciate and understand the interactions between civilizations which were key to the development of Southeast Asia, the Middle East, China, and the wider world, and which continue till today. Historically, Singapore has been a key node along the ancient, ancient maritime silk road, with its position on the Straits of Malacca, at the southernmost point of the Asian continent, connecting the Pacific and Indian Ocean basins. Today, Singapore continues to be a hub for trade and the exchange of ideas. Singapore supports China's Belt and Road Initiative as it sees the benefit of enhanced connectivity and development in the Silk Road spirit of peace and cooperation, openness and inclusiveness, mutual learning and mutual benefit. A key part of building mutual respect and understanding is building cultural and historical exchanges. Over the years, our cultural institutions have built strong relationships and enjoy frequent and extensive cultural exchanges. And today's conference is one example of this. I'm pleased to see that the ACM has gathered leading international scholars curators and archaeologists, people like yourselves, to exchange research and perspectives that will add to our collective body of knowledge of the maritime soup. COVID-19 has reinforced the importance of striving even harder to maintain the links between countries and peoples. It has shown how we cannot take these links for granted. The Tang shipwreck collection tells the story of how we have all connected and worked together over centuries to overcome challenges together and achieve shared prosperity and human progress. I'd like to thank the ACM for organizing this conference and for all of you, speakers and participants, for sharing your experience. 
I hope that you will have many fruitful discussions over the next two days. And we hope to be able to welcome you in Singapore to see the collection yourself in the future, in the near future, and have a discussion with the collection in front of you. And for those who will be enjoying the collection in Shanghai, the exhibition in Shanghai, I wish you all the very best as well. Thank you very much and have a good seminar. Thank you very much, SMTO. Thank you, sir. SMTO will be now taking his leave for another engagement. SMTO, sir, thank you very much for gracing our event today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, SMTO. Have a good, have a good conference. Thank you, SMTO. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let, let us join Dr. Stephen Murphy. He's a senior curator from the Asian Civilizations Museum in conversation with Dr. Tencent Sen, professor of history and director of the Center for Global History for Global Asia, pardon me, at NYU Shanghai and Global Network Professor at New York University. As they discuss this topic of floating cosmopolitanism, conceptualizing Indian Ocean interactions beyond silk. In this conversation, Professor Sen will argue for a reconceptualization of the Indian Ocean world through the prism of floating cosmopolitanism. Dr. Tencent Sen is Professor of History and the Director of the Center for Global Asia at NYU Shanghai and Global Network Professor at New York University. Previously, he was a faculty at City University of New York and founding head of the Nalandan Srivijaya Center at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, Singapore. He's the author of Buddhism, Diplomacy and Trade, The Realignment of Sino-Indian Relations, 600 to 1400, and India, China, and the World, A Connected History. He's currently working on a book about Zheng He's maritime expeditions in the early 15th century, a monograph on Jawaharlal Nehru and China, and co-editing the Cambridge History of the Indian Ocean, Volume 1. Dr. Stephen Murphy is Senior Curator for Southeast Asia at the Asian Civilizations Museum, Singapore. He holds a PhD from the Department of History of Art and Archaeology, SOAS, University of London. He specializes in the art and archaeology of early Buddhism and Hinduism in Thailand, Laos, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Malaysia. He has a particular interest in the period spanning the 7th to the 9th century AD and looks at trade and connections between Southeast Asia cultures and also the wider world of Tang, China, India, and beyond. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to hand the time over to Dr. Stephen Murphy in conversation with Dr. Tenson Sen. Dr. Murphy, please. Thank you, Lester. Um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, first of all, just very quickly, I'd also like to um, give my thanks and appreciation to uh, Senior Minister Tio for his welcome address, uh, to all our colleagues at MCCY who've uh, made, you know, helped to make this event possible. Kenny, our director for his constant support. And of course, uh, Dr. Tansen Sen, who I have woken up on a very early uh, New York morning to, to give a keynote. I, I think this is probably maybe a first a keynote at 6.37 a.m. So I owe you, I owe you a, a coffee at the very least. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Really what we're gonna do today um, in this, we've got about uh, 50 minutes to, uh, to discuss this, this concept that, um, that Tansen is, um, is proposing in terms of um, uh, floating cosmopolitanism. And really I, I asked Tencent to, uh, to give the keynote because I wanted to frame the discussions and frame the, the, the symposium as a whole really. Um, and I, I hope that this, um, this keynote tonight will do that. And really not just to look at, at the, the term maritime Silk Road, um, but also to explore it in a bit more depth and also you know to problematize it as well. It's a somewhat uh, contentious term or, or disputed in, in some in some ways people uh, some well we'll get into that tonight and that's part in, in the discussion um, and so really in terms of the format we have a, a PowerPoint presentation that, that Tencent put together and but it's going to be much more of a conversation style so myself and Tencent will will go through it for about 20 minutes 25 minutes and, and hopefully we will uh, 
elicit some of these ideas and concepts and, and, and uh, problems or contestations. And then after that, we'd really like to open it up to you in the audience so that you, we leave about 25, 30 minutes so we can have a, a Q and A discussion. So this is really your chance as well to, to ask Tansen or even myself about our ideas and, and, and so forth in terms of this topic. So, so without uh, any further ado, Tansen, I think we'll, we'll start off if that's okay. Sure. Uh, thank you, Stephen, and, and thanks to Minister Thio um, and, and Kenny uh, for inviting me to give this uh, keynote address from my kitchen uh, in New York City. Uh, I think it's not just too early, it's also the first time a keynote address is perhaps taking place from my kitchen. Um, now, uh, I had mentioned this to Stephen uh, earlier, and perhaps Kenny doesn't know this, uh, my first uh, public lecture uh, in Singapore was actually at ACM uh, at this wonderful auditorium that you have uh, at the museum. Uh, and this was, I think, in 2010, 2011, uh, and about 350 uh, people registered for that. I don't see 350 participants today, Stephen. Um, <laughs> we're close, we're getting there. <laughs> I, I, I had to do it twice uh, at ACM because I think the auditorium holds about 200 people. Uh, but it is, uh, it is good to be back uh, virtually. Uh, in Singapore. Uh, I do miss uh, some of the friends I have. Uh, uh, John Mexic is there, I know. Uh, Himangshu is there. Derek is there, but also new friends. Natalie also participating, so I miss interacting with them. Uh, but this is how the new normal is, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll have uh, these kinds of interactions through virtual means. Uh, it will save money and also the environment as well. Um, I also like this conversation format instead of me giving a monotonous uh, 45 minute lecture, uh, it would be good to have a conversation not only with Stephen, but others who are participating in this uh, concept that I'm trying to formulate about floating cosmopolitanism. Uh, and I would appreciate uh, uh, any kind of feedback that you may have uh, with regard to this, this concept. Uh, and looking at Indian Ocean, uh, perhaps in a, in a different way uh, than has been done uh, previously and even, uh, even uh, in this conference today. Uh, so Stephen had uh, asked me to talk about the, the key term in the title of the conference. And I, let me mention that uh, since I'm talking from New York City and uh, there are noises of New York City that you may uh, hear in the background, so I apologize for that. Uh, things have improved here, so we don't uh, hear many sirens these days, uh, but it was pretty bad in March and April where there will be a siren and ambulance going by. There are still noises that may interfere, and if that happens, if there's a problem with the internet, Stephen will take over and, and, and start talking instead of I. Um, so that's the other benefit of this conversation start. Uh, but uh, Stephen had asked me to talk about this term, uh, Maritime Silk Road. Uh, and I think uh, most uh, of the audience members and, and participants uh, know that uh, the term Silk Road uh, actually originated from a German geographer, uh, uh, Ferdinand uh, Richthofen, in about 1877 when he coined this term, the Silk Road. Uh, and then he was a person exploring uh, the Western regions of, of China and, and started noticing remains of silk, uh, and, and he came up with this term, uh, became popular uh, mostly in the 20th century, uh, and uh, Tamara Chin uh, from Brown University uh, has written a wonderful article on the origins uh, and problems with the term Silk Road, uh, which I would recommend uh, to uh, people if they are interested in looking at uh, the, the uh, various issues with the term Silk Road. Now, the term maritime Silk Road, on the other hand, uh, is not well uh, researched, uh, and people usually don't know who came up uh, with this, uh, this term, uh, maritime Silk Road. Uh, and uh, for the last year or so, I've been looking at the origins of this term, uh, maritime Silk Road. And I'll say a little bit about this, how that term came about, uh, and perhaps uh, we can talk about um, the uses and problems with this term, maritime Silk Road. So let's see, uh, yeah, so the PowerPoint here is actually uh, something that Stephen and I will remotely work on. Uh, both of us have clickers, uh, so it's, it's a, it may create some issues, but 
uh, hopefully will work things uh, things out. Now the, the person I, I, I found uh, to be the most relevant uh, with regard to coming up with this term uh, is somebody called Chen Ye. Uh, I think the Chinese scholars here would know him, uh, his work, but uh, most foreign scholars perhaps may have not uh, heard about, about him, but I think he is the person who coined the term uh, maritime sucrose uh, in Chinese and then uh, UNESCO, uh, I'll point out, uh, created the English term uh, in about 1991. Uh, this Chen Ye is, is a really a fascinating person uh, who actually taught uh, at my alma mater at Peking University in a department that I was, uh, I was also affiliated with the Oriental Languages and Literature uh, Department where a very famous Chinese scholar, uh, scholar of Ch uh, India-China interactions uh, and Indian history and Indian literature, Qi Xian Lin, uh, actually worked. Uh, and Chen Yan in, in his memoir, which is the picture that you see here, uh, actually talks about how in the 1950s he read uh, an article by Qi Xian Lin on the transmission of silk uh, and paper from, uh, from China to India. Uh, and that initially influenced him into looking at the importance of silk uh, as an important commodity. Uh, and it was not until after the Cultural Revolution that he started working on, on that topic. Uh, and it was in uh, 1980 that he first proposed uh, a concept of Southwest Silk Road, uh, which is the, the route that linked uh, Yunnan to, to India. And this was uh, definitely influenced by Chi Sen Lin because in his writing, uh, Professor Chi had proposed uh, that route as one of the important linkages between China uh, and, and uh, India. And, and so this uh, idea that he proposed with this term, the Southwest uh, Silk Road became an important uh, way of looking at uh, routes that are beyond the Central Asian route that Richtofen had, had organized. A year later in, in a conference in 1981, he actually proposed this idea uh, of uh, maritime silk road. Um, and uh, his main arguments, and, and this is something that uh, he formulates uh, over the course of a couple of years, uh, and he starts looking at connections between China and Japan and Korea initially. So, uh, and then he argues as early as the Chou and the Qin dynasties, uh, there were maritime linkages between uh, these Chinese dynasties and uh, uh, Korea and, and Japan. Um, then he says they developed a South China Sea Silk Road uh, connections with Southeast Asia uh, prior to the Tang Dynasty. Uh, and then he calls something as a developmental period of the Maritime Silk Road, uh, which basically there's an increased export and consumption uh, of silk uh, and then he's focusing mostly on the Tang and Song dynasties. And then he calls, and this may be surprising to some of you, that the golden age of maritime silk road actually happens in the Yuan uh, to the Qing dynasties, uh, connecting um, uh, the Americas as well. Now, there are problems with these kinds of framework, um, uh, and, and that is something that I would like to briefly also point out. Uh, but uh, as he wrote about these things, it became very popular. Uh, it, it, one of his first articles about the Maritime Silk Road was published in 1982 uh, in the Li Shi Yen a very important uh, Chinese historical journal. Uh, it was also translated into English, uh, published in China Reconstructs, uh, and also Social Sciences in China, also a very important English language uh, uh, publication from China. So it became very popular, uh, very rapidly within some of the communities uh, in, in, in China. Now this map that we see today uh, quite often actually originates from the early 80s as well. Uh, and it appears in the social sciences in China journal. And then you notice that what is called in English here is Silk Roads of the Sea. Uh, and um, the, the, the maps are similar to what we have today. So the origins uh, of this term maritime Silk Road, the maps that we see today uh, on the maritime linkages uh, dates back to the 1980s. And, and this is a really fascinating thing that I, I, I started looking at how in the 1980s uh, it started uh, developing in China. Now, one of the ways it became internationally popular 
the term maritime silk road has to do with UNESCO. UNESCO in 1991 uh, did a conference in Chuancho, uh, which was called China and the Maritime Silk Road. Uh, sounds very familiar. Uh, yeah, Steve, so I, I, I only realized that from, from when, I, when, I, when I saw your slide, I was like, oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's a coincidence. But. Right, so, so it was actually from uh, uh, Chen Yan who presented at this Chuancho conference as well. Uh, it was UNESCO who popularized this term to the international uh, community. Uh, now, as, as you look at, uh, and this is a very fascinating thing Google has, uh, Ngram viewer, you can trace certain terms over the course of, of history. So you see the first time uh, that the term appears uh, in English language, this is 10 years English language publications is around 1982. Uh, that uh, the first time the term is, is emerging. Uh, it then in 1991, 1992, uh, it is UNESCO that uh, popularizes this term. And, and then finally it is uh, the, the Beijing Olympics where it becomes really, really popular. And, and this term becomes uh, an important way of looking at the maritime connections, right? So this is the, the origin, Stephen, of Mm -hmm. uh, the, the term Maritime Silk Road, uh, Chen Yan, UNESCO, Beijing Olympics, three important markers. And then we come to ACM, which with the Tang Shipwreck, you are making it even more popular. Yeah, I wonder on, on that point. It's, so it's interesting because as you've, so, uh, as you've shown, the, the origins of this term are very much generated um, out of Chinese scholarship within the Chinese language first and then gets translated into English, as you said, by UNESCO. So again, it's interesting the role that, the, the key role that UNESCO plays in a lot of these uh, Silk Road narratives, of course, you know, we know of the, um, the uh, Chang'an Tancheng corridor as well, for, for example. But I wonder then is, is this, you know, when we, we start to look at some of the sort of maybe objections in some cases to this term, is, is it because it's, it's so much a, a China focused um, or it is quite, it sounds like a quite a China centric narrative, but of course what we're seeing as well um, in the rest of the Indian Ocean world, if we look at India, for example, it's also um, coming up, you know, sort of coming up with its own um, ideas of, of maritime trade and, you know, under the project Mosim is, is one example of how they've, they've, they've sort of looked, uh, you know, from the monsoon point of view, right, and, and the Arab world and the Indian Ocean world to develop their own concept and then of course in Indonesia now we have the idea of the spice, spice fruit. So, so we're starting to see, um, you know, not just, I guess, and then as you've, you've pointed out at ACM, we've sort of put our own uh, spin on, on it, you know, in a, in a sort of, uh, we, we like to say sort of uh, Asia through the lens of Singapore, right? We're looking at it from uh, this node, this hub right in the center of Southeast Asia. And also in terms of like uh, between the, the sort of, the Indian Ocean and, and of course the South China Sea, so it's a key key point. So it's really depending on your perspective, right? This this term may be uh, problematic or it may be useful and so forth. So I think in the next slides, yeah, we go on and, and you look at a, is it a misnomer? Is it a useful term? So maybe you could speak a little bit more towards those issues and also the idea that you know it, it's in all of these examples I've cited, it's still quite nation state. Um, bound, which in a, in in a way is sort of paradoxical because if we're talking about the seas and so forth, then then it's a it's a sort of move away from you know that physical territory. But I guess that's sort of maybe one of the concepts of your uh, uh, floating cosmopolitanism. Right, uh, and uh, the problem I have with this term is exactly what you are pointing out, Stephen. Uh, that it emphasizes one nation state um, and one uh, commodity, uh, luxury right, commodity. Right, that's the other main issue, right, of course, which sometimes people have more objections over the commodity, I feel, than, than the actual, say, association with, with say, one, one nation state or, or another, for that matter. Yeah, and, and uh, if you look at some of the presentations in this conference uh, tomorrow and day after uh, Singapore time, of course, um, uh, the commodities discussed are, are porcelain, ceramics. Uh, Himangshu is talking about uh, metals, 
uh, uh, Natalie is talking about uh, disease and, and, uh, uh, and human resources. But these are some of the commodities that, that we find if you look at uh, Indian Ocean connections. Uh, why not any of these? Uh, Belitong right. is famous for its ceramics and porcelain. Uh, why not porcelain root? Uh, but that might also emphasize one commodity and one nation state. Right. Um, it also, uh, I think, is a problem with uh, unidirectional uh, things uh, that this term emphasizes as if everything is going from and to China, uh, which as we right. know, was not uh, how uh, things worked. Uh, and, and also uh, circulation of ideas uh, beyond just the commodities uh, is missed out when we just talk about maritime silk route. Yeah, exactly. This is the other thing that I've been thinking about. Of course, you know, the obvious one is religions, right? If, you know, we both, of course, look at, at Buddhism in, in various uh, capacities, but, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, and then later, Islam in particular, are all spread throughout the regions on, um, on these maritime routes. So again, I think, you know, Himanshu in her latest work is really pointing this out as well, that, that by focusing on trade in general and, and commodities, we miss, you know, we miss a lot of the story. And so again, it's, you know, sometimes they don't call it, like you said, don't call it maritime silk road, call it maritime ceramic route. But then again, you run into these other, another problem of, of uh, privileging another you know, uh, um, commodity over another. And so I think for me, it's quite, you know, the idea, like it's also a technolo technologies and concepts in general flow back and forth along it. So yeah, it's, you know, how do we, how do we sort of have a more holistic uh, viewpoint of this, this phenomenon? Yeah, and, and, and you know, Indian Ocean is, is quite vast. You can have just Indian Ocean interactions, mm -hmm. which would uh, incorporate uh, all of these things. But uh, the other thing that uh, Maritime Silk Road uh, perhaps uh, does, which is perhaps incorrect uh, ways of looking at the Indian Ocean interactions, uh, is that it presents a very romanticized view uh, of the maritime interactions as if uh, there were no conflicts, uh, as if there were no problems. Uh, and, and this comes about when we shift the focus to the people uh, instead of the commodities. You mentioned uh, religion, uh, but also migration of people, Indians, yeah, that's, Chinese, that's cool. um, uh, Malay uh, moving around in these uh, uh, Arabs in this maritime space. So if you notice in your conference, Stephen, there's not a single uh, paper on silk, right? Uh, there's not a single paper until we get to the human resources at the end on, on the people of the Indian Ocean. I know. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> like, so, like, so one of the things like that I... For pointing out a... <laughs> <laughs> so if we on the exported gifted to the Indian Ocean, and, and that's what I find in many of these conferences on maritime silk road, there's not a single paper talking about uh, quantifying the export of, of silk. Uh, Valerie Hansen has looked at uh, maritime, uh, the, the Silk Road and, and the issue of the volume of trade. Uh, and and uh, I don't know if we can look at the volume of trade uh, with regard to silk uh, on the Indian Ocean, but uh, hardly any papers focus on, uh, uh, on, on the silk export, uh, silk circulation. There's a paper on silk worms, uh, I think, but uh, not from China. Uh, but clearly, I think there are many ways of looking at, at the Indian Ocean. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to emphasize in the keynote today uh, the importance of people mm, yeah. uh, and, and, this, uh, and people uh, and, and cosmopolitanism uh, brings that aspect in. Uh, and and that's, that's, the, that's the thing I wanted uh, to emphasize. Right. So, yeah, let's get, let's get down to uh, this concept. Then we've, we've sort of outlined the problems and the problematic nature of... Uh, of the term. So I, I'm glad you've come up with it. I always find if someone's, if you're going to critique something, that's fine, but I always feel then you have to propose an alternative, right? So, so I'm quite interested to hear um, more about your, your concept of, of floating cosmopolitanism. Yeah, so uh, this idea actually came um, uh, when I was reading Amita Ghosh's uh, Ibis Trilogy. Ah, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, in, in, in his Ibis trilogy, those of you who have read it, in fact, at ACM, we did uh, a presentation by Amitav uh, 
when he was in Singapore, um, he talks about life on ships, uh, on boats, the languages spoken by the Laskars. He actually found a wonderful dictionary of, of Laskar language. And, and that's, that's what uh, led me to think about what actually happened uh, on the ships um, when people travel. Uh, and the fact that uh, uh, there were many different people uh, on these ships. Uh, and then when I uh, am doing research on Chengha, uh, and one of the fascinating aspects of Chengha's travels uh, on, on the ships, um, large ships, we don't know how large they exactly were, but we know there were many different people present on those ships, Arab nav navigators, diplomats from different parts of the world. Um, so what happened? How did they talk to each other? Um, it was Persian the language that they were talking? Uh, who were the translators? Those are the interesting things uh, I've been looking at. Uh, and, and that's the reason from Amitav's Ibis trilogy to looking at Chang'e's ships, um, not talking about the length of the ships, uh, the, the advanced nature uh, or, or technology of the ships, but what can we deduce about what was happening on the ships with the people present from different parts of the Indian Ocean, right? Uh, and what were they right. doing? And it's not just diversity of the people, but the diversity of languages, religions, mm. and so forth on these ships, uh, which I think would be a fascinating way of looking at uh, the Chang'e voyages uh, as well. Okay. The term, uh, I'll come to the floating part. It may be easier to explain than the cosmopolitanism uh, uh, word. Uh, and like all the fancy words, it has a Greek origin, all right? Uh, <laughs> uh, and and it, it, it implied uh, in early on, uh, this was in the concept of the Greek polis, uh, uh, instead of belonging to one of this polis, uh, it's basically citizen of the world, right? I mean, it's, it's a universal presence of, of human or person uh, that does not just belong to one entity, right? Uh, and Indian Ocean is, is, is that, and, and I think that's the, one of the reasons I emphasize that. Uh, cosmopolitanism also emphasizes internationalism, uh, consciousness of the world. Uh, and this is, again, something beyond nation states. Right? Right. Uh, it does not emphasize one nation, uh, but it emphasizes uh, presence of people universally or universalism of the people. Uh, and I would recommend one particular book. Uh, this is an edited volume by Carol Breckenridge. It's called Cosmopolitanism. Um, one of the important contributions in this edited volume is uh, the introduction, which is called Cosmopolitanisms with an S at mm -hmm. the end. Um, it's, uh, it's written by different people, uh, Carol being one, but Homi Baba uh, is another, Dipesh Chakrabarti, and of course, Shelley Pollack uh, together, uh, they came up with this term cosmopolitanism and compare this, this term uh, with feminisms uh, rather than one way of looking at feminism. Uh, they talk about different ways of looking at feminisms. And they say a cosmopolitanism is infinite way of being emphasizes multiple forms of cosmopolitanisms. Uh, and, and that's the important fact that there can be different ways in which cosmopolitanism exists, including on ships, right? Um, recently, I've been talking about Buddhisms because there's multiple right. ways in which Buddhism is practiced. Uh, uh, and I think uh, we should use multiple forms of Buddhism because Chinese Buddhism in different parts of China are different from Japanese Buddhism and Indian Buddhism, Sri Lankan Buddhism. And, and so I think cosmopolitanism, which basically means uh, for me, uh, presence of multiple diverse groups of people speaking different languages uh, at one space. Uh, and, and, and this is uh, something that uh, I would say one of the many cosmopolitanism which happens on, on the ships. Now, the second uh, term or the first term in floating cosmopolitanism is the floating part. Um, now, this is a famous image. Uh, of course, the ship is floating. Uh, the surface of the sea is important. But I wanted to also emphasize the vertical aspect of things as you float on the Indian Ocean. As you see on this, uh, this image, there are fish uh, underneath. So equally important is what happens under the surface of uh, the sea or the ocean. Uh, there are a number of papers about shipwrecks uh, in this conference, uh, and the shipwrecks are, of course, at the bottom of, of the ocean. 
but there are many other issues that sailors dealt with uh, under the sea, under the ocean as they travel. So I think when we talk about floating, it's not only the surface that is relevant, it's also what is below the surface uh, that is relevant. Uh, I'll point out pearls, for example, comes from under the water. Uh, and, and that's why uh, that uh, underwater aspect is, is also uh, important. Um, and also important is the sky. Uh, this, oops, let me just go back. Um, this is a famous uh, map uh, from, and John Mixick would know this uh, clearly. Uh, what is happening when people are floating uh, is that they are looking at the skies for directions. So the stars uh, and, uh, and, and, and the images that appear on, on the sky with the stars are equally important to figure out where you are going. So the environmental aspect of things uh, are also quite important. So it's, it's instead of looking at horizontally connections between different mass land masses from one port city in China to a port city in India, uh, we should also look at what's happening on the sea as people look down under the water. Uh, look up into the sky, uh, are concerned with the environmental changes, uh, El Nino, for example, uh, it becomes important that uh, the floating cosmopolitanism includes uh, not only the diverse presence of the people, but also the physical aspect of traveling, which is the sky, which is the environment, which is the surface of this ocean, which is the bottom of the ocean. Uh, now, what happens uh, is that diverse people come together, but on the ships, there are other living organisms, animals, for example, right? Uh, and also germs. Uh, and, and so if you move our focus from uh, just the artifacts, commodities, and look at the life, it's not just the people, but also the animals that are carried uh, on the ships and the germs that are transferred from one place to another. One common point uh, uh, of, of this is that uh, people are equally in the risk of, of uh, sinking uh, and belly tung sinks and nobody is asking what happened to the people uh, on people, the wreck. Yeah, that's the, always the, people ask that question quite a bit, but no one, of course, has been able to. Uh, right. Uh, uh, I, I hope Michael Fick, uh, Fick yes, could tell us if, if mm -hmm. he found any skeletons right. uh, or not uh, when, when he was excavating, but there's an equal share of risk. Now, on the ships, there is, of course, diversity, people from different groups. Some are of high class, they are elites, uh, and they are also Laskars. They are uh, perhaps also people who are endangered laborers. And this is what I think when cosmopolitanism is being discussed, it's not just about the elites in cities. It's about street hawkers. It's about the beggars in, in large cities. They are part of it. And this edited volume by Carol also the cosmopolitan is not just an elite uh, or romanticized views about cities, but it's also the presence of, of people who are of the lower class. So that's right. that's what uh, I, I meant uh, by uh, by this floating. I think it's an important an important distinction because I guess when you know even today when people think of cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism or cosmopolitan cities, maybe in a in a modern sense there's a somewhat of a connotation of globalism or a sort of globalized um, concept as well, which. Which is interesting, you know, we're sort of seeing shifts, uh, or as I think as SMTO even mentioned in his, his opening uh, address, there's a sort of move right now, you know, a sort of anti-cosmopolitanism as such as, as, you know, we sort of get nation states throughout the world, really, you know, in different regions sort of closing off a bit. So it's, and, it, and I guess one of the criticisms of this kind of idea of a cosmopolitan port city is always that it sounds uh, elitist or, you know, that it's this quite idealized, you know, idea that it's a happy melting pot where everybody gets along. But as we know, that's not always the case. And of course, there's been examples in history as well of, of you know, pogroms and so forth. You know, even in, in Tang, China, we know of examples uh, in, in certain port cities and so forth. So, so it's a, I, I guess it's important to qualify that in terms of, um, in terms of your concept. But so maybe on that, on that point, what, what are the sort of, what, I mean, uh, the language issue is, is very interesting. It, it's maybe hard to get to sometimes because if you look at something like the Tang shipwreck, um, where we don't have um, 
we don't have the evidence of language, but if you look at something like the Shinan shipwreck, you know, it was a famous case where, of course, they have the 14th century Shinan shipwreck. They actually have, uh, they know exactly what temple in, in Japan it was, it was uh, the goods were bound for because they have the, the, the uh, evidence, the, the textual evidence. But so how do we, how do we sort of get to, you know, what sort of evidence can we, can you propose or what sort of evidence are we looking at in order to maybe develop this concept more in terms of, uh, you know, what it is and, and, and who are these people as well? That, like, how do we get to the interactions between who, between these people who are floating? Um, and is it always e egalitarian? I mean, there is, yes, they're sharing the risk in one sense, but, but of course, you know, we know from a lot of historical examples, uh, the sort of elites or the upper class on, on, on these ships may be the first to be saved and the sort of uh, lower class people are down in the, you know, down in the hold. So it's not, again, you, you start in this floating world, you see the same tensions and, and maybe power dynamics reflected that you, you see on land as well, but they're just transported onto a, onto a different, uh, into a different environment. Maybe they get more emphasized there or, or maybe they break down in, as well. So I wonder how you, how you think about that? So yes, I, I think the tensions are, are quite important, and, and you you have pointed out the criticism of, of cosmopolitanism concept, uh, and and that's the one thing I wanted to highlight uh, in floating cosmopolitanism are the tensions among the people who travel uh, on, on on ships, uh, and and just not to emphasize uh, the elite nature of, of this term that people may think about. Uh, but uh, speaking about languages, before I get onto these some mm. of these uh, issues, um, you know, you have one of the very important linguistic evidence uh, in the Bellitum shipwreck. It's the the first use of the term T, all right. Uh, and then one of the bowls that you have uh, has uh, has this term that my uh, advisor Victor Mayer uh, has written about uh, the the term uh, or the Chinese character. For, for tea that appears on one of the that's bowls. Right. I think yeah. that's one of the important findings. So you can see, you can actually look at the linguistic aspects mm -hmm. uh, from things written on uh, on some of these uh, discoveries that you have made. So, so you, there are linguistic evidence that you can find uh, from the shipwrecks, uh, depends on what exactly you are looking uh, at. Now, um, yes, uh, the, the, the tensions, the complications of cosmopolitanism uh, appears when you look at the different groups of people who were involved in the floating part, right? Even before uh, things float, shipbuilding itself is, is a diverse activities with different groups of people. It's not just about who is financing boats, but who are the workers uh, who are involved in uh, making the ships, right? Uh, the tree cutters, the carpenters, the mast makers, uh, the coconut coir makers. This is, of course, for the early Daos uh, and, and uh, South Asian ships. The shipbuilders, the dock workers, right? They are part of this port city cosmopolitanism. Right. Right? They are all in, in, in the port cities in, in some ways. Uh, so we see that uh, it's not a story about the elites. It's not the story about the rich who finance the building of the ship or own the ships. Right. Uh, then on the ship itself, you have Laskars, right? you have ship captains, you have pilots, you have navigators, you have translators, you have security personnel, you have passengers, which includes animals uh, and, and humans, and humans can be of different uh, groups, right? Uh, there can be endangered labors on, on this. Uh, of course, there are commodities, but uh, there are also daily necessities, right? People have to eat, so there are things that are not exported. So food products like chicken and pigs and, and things. Um, these are the fascinating things. Uh, many of the uh, importance of, of floating cosmopolitanism is also the kinds of food or cuisine that comes up when mm, you are yeah, I mean, on the food. Interesting concept. Yeah, and um, that, yeah, yeah. In terms of yeah, what, what has been um, consumed, then we have, I guess, again, we have a few examples. Well, we, we tried it from the Belton wreck, but it's an interesting concept. Yeah, so, so uh, emphasizing the diversity of passengers, the diversity of experiences uh, on the sea is something that uh, uh, I wanted to emphasize. Mm -hmm. Looking at 
and, and you can find it. There are many different sources. Since you asked about the sources, I, I'm, I'm going to just talk about um, a number of sources and, and then we can have more free flowing discussion on sure. this. Um, just to point out what kind of records that I'm looking at uh, and, and how they are, are relevant uh, to this idea about floating cosmopolitanism and the diverse uh, uh, experience of the, of the people as they travel uh, on, on boats. Uh, so one of, one of the earliest uh, uh, writings that we have about maritime travel uh, is this voyage of Fasian, uh, uh, as I think most of you know. Uh, he was traveling from, um, first he traveled from India to Sri Lanka uh, on a boat and then from Sri Lanka to Southeast Asia and from Southeast Asia uh, to China. And, and what he experiences is just fascinating. He experiences a cyclone. Uh, this is an environmental issues. Then he experiences people who are not Buddhist. Uh, they are most likely Brahmins who are planning to throw him out of the ship, right? Uh, so the tension. <laughs> Right? I mean, right. it's all because of this, this monk that we are encountering uh, this kind of uh, disaster. Let's throw him out uh, and, and not risk uh, our lives because of this one man. So, you know, the tension that happened on the ship, uh, we know about the Titanic and what happened when it started sinking. But, you know, Farsian experienced something like, uh, like that. He didn't sink, of course. Uh, but, you know, the tension among the passengers uh, with uh, not only traders and, and merchants, but people who practice different religion traveling together and they could get into various kinds of problems, all right? So, so I think Fashians travel from, from Sri Lanka to Southeast Asia, from Southeast Asia to, to China is, is very, very important to understand uh, the problems with floating cosmopolitanism and the tensions that happen uh, on, on the ships as people travel from one place to another. Now there is uh, uh, another, uh, this is from uh, Arab sources, uh, Arab and Persian sources. There are uh, various ways in, 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 in looking at what happened under the water, right? So, uh, uh, and, and this quest for pearl, and there's a very fascinating story about this orphan pearl that was uh, 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 fished out of the water. Uh, and, and this is when you are on the ship, but you are fishing things out from under the water. So. Uh, it's not just traveling, but also ex uh, exploring or uh, exploring uh, the underwater resources. Uh, in this uh, case, uh, uh, an important pearl, and this is a very interesting story that happens uh, in, in, in West Asia, uh, where somebody fishes out a very famous uh, pearl. So commodities come from under the water, uh, and, and you can see that uh, as well. And, and this is an image from a Chinese source where you can see how the bottom of the sea where somebody is actually uh, taking out oyster uh, and bringing pearls. So the, the boat is on the surface, but the goal is under the water, fishing the pearl. So this, I think, on the surface, part of the Indian Ocean or the seas are also important. You are getting an important commodity from the sea itself, which is at the bottom of the sea. Um, now, the other... Uh, source that, that uh, I see is, is from a later period. And this is where uh, we usually, when we look at Indian Ocean, it's a highly gendered way of looking at Indian Ocean. It's almost always men. It's good, um, it's good to have brought this up actually at this point, because just, just to sort of cut in, sorry, there's actually two questions that are addressing specifically this point um, from Rina Canetti and also Vibio Amaro. Again, uh, you know, about the fact that, you know, um, Bibeo asks, you know, is um, he's wondering if the majority of the passengers on these ships are male or female, do entire families travel and so forth. And, you know, also, as Marina points out, that, that life on ships generally seems to be a, a sort of a gendered, there's a, a gendering in terms of crew and so forth. So, so yeah, I just thought I'd, I'd interject there because it, it brings in the, the discussion that are the questions that people are having. But I think the the example that you're you're actually going to talk about now is really a very important one. Yeah, so this this is connected to several things uh, related to the movement of people over the Indian Ocean. This is of course part of migration, the story about how Indians and, and also Chinese were taken to the sugar plantations uh, by the British. Uh, and this is a, a story about one uh, coolie woman 
who was taken to uh, French Guyana. Uh, and uh, she talks about, I mean, there are a number of women in, in the story who talk about their experience with a surgeon and, and, and on the ships, then we have medical personalities, right? So uh, of people who took care of, uh, of any diseases that may have happened. There are also veterinarians taking care of, of animals uh, on the ship. Uh, but uh, the surgeons were not necessarily good people. Uh, and, and this is again emphasizing uh, the, the tension uh, and, and how they harassed the, the women on the ships. And, and there are four or five so stories about how uh, the, the, uh, the men surgeons were actually harassing women. Uh, and, and these are really sad stories. Uh, and we miss out on, this, on these kinds of stories uh, not only about the presence of the medical staff on, on ships, but the presence of women uh, and their experiences, uh, which seems to be very different. This is an endangered uh, labor uh, and, and she is experiencing uh, harassment. What do you do with that? Uh, is that not a story of Indian Ocean? Uh, and, and I, I think uh, the, the reason to emphasize um, non-elite part of the Indian Ocean story is to look at the experience of of the endangered labors. But there's also stories about people going on Hajj uh, and how they experience a religious aspect of traveling on the ships. But I, I brought out this, um, this, uh, this story to say that women were also present uh, on yeah, the ship. What is their story? Yeah, uh, and, and they are records. Right, and it's really important, I think, because as you have, uh, you've highlighted, you've highlighted, I think, at the start as well and going through that, you know, there's, there's always a danger um, when we talk about maritime trade and 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 even of sort of only focusing on the on the positive aspects. But of course, trade always has it has this darker side that you that this example clearly brings up. Not just in terms of the treatment of, of women on in terms of on the ships, but but the indentured labor. So it's the movement of it's the forced movement of people's um, under you know pretty appalling conditions that. At certain times, so I, I guess this, what I'm trying to get at is that there's there's darker aspects and darker elements that that also need to be discussed and and somehow investigated, so we have a more a more balanced and nuanced you know appreciation or understanding of 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 the maritime world and the maritime sphere, which again I think sometimes is missing in in the dialogues and and, and you know conferences that we 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 all set up. Uh, we like to focus on, like you say, silk and the ceramics and so forth. But, but I, I hopefully there's a sort of there is now a bit of a shift to look more at, at these at these issues. Yeah. So, so the other thing I also wanted to bring out what uh, existed on the ships are, are music, the noise mm. uh, on the ships, right? I mean, uh, singing and and music. Uh, I think Gori uh, just wrote that they were also entertainers. Uh, these are not. not not entertainers, these are people on ships uh, and singing music uh, is part of, of what perhaps happened. And even Batuta, uh, when he was traveling from, from Southeast Asia to China, talks about a Chinese junk uh, on which uh, people who were uh, uh, actually driving the, the ship, uh, the, they were singing. Um, uh, mm -hmm. We don't know what kind of songs these were, but certainly in many traditions, boatmen uh, actually sang, the fishermen sang. Uh, and, and these are the, the music, the noise of floating cosmopolitanism, uh, and again connected uh, suddenly to the, to the people uh, as well. And, and this is again something uh, that we should also look at, what kind of noise, what kind of music, what kind of uh, languages uh, took place. Uh, and, and I think that is again something that uh, needs to be looked at, and I think is, is part of uh, the uh, floating uh, cosmopolitanism. There are two things I just wanted to end with. Of course. Um, one is also we forget there were animals uh, on the ships. Uh, and I recently wrote uh, a, a paper uh, and many of these things uh, I'm talking about is because I've been uh, dealing with anthropologists for the last five years and they have had a uh, huge influence on, on the ways in which I do history. Uh, but uh, uh, how are animal animals transported. Um, and I, I looked at uh, uh, elephants uh, and giraffes being transported uh, on, on ships. Uh, and these, they have their fascinating stories. And if you remember 
port cities, cosmopolitanism includes animals. There are zoos uh, and, and other animals, a uh, part of the city life. Uh, and, and this is a fascinating part, uh, animals moving from one place to another. Uh, and then here there's a tension about how you force animals uh, onto the ships. It's not easy to get an elephant on a ship and, and, and keep uh, the, the elephant uh, peaceful on, on the ship. Uh, is, is also something that uh, we should, uh, should look at. Mm. Uh, and finally, I want to end uh, with something that uh, is relevant uh, to today, uh, uh, is of course uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, the word quarantine uh, we know is associated with uh, maritime quarantining of ships for 40 days. Uh, but this is from 19th century when uh, USA when people would not allow uh, passengers from the ships to come down uh, to the coast because of health reasons. Um, uh, and, and germs uh, are important passengers uh, on ships. Uh, I know Natalie is going to talk about COVID and, and uh, how to uh, bring about human resources, but we cannot forget that ships as they moved uh, also carried rats, uh, carried germs from one place to another. Uh, and, and those pathogens are, are important part of floating cosmopolitanism uh, as well. So just to, just to summarize, I would say floating cosmopolitanism for me is the story of the people who were traveling on the Indian Ocean, the things that they were doing on the ships, the animals that were transported, uh, and the diseases that uh, were transmitted from one place to another. These are all part of floating cosmopolitanism uh, for me. Thank you. Yeah, I think what I like about what you've done at that is that you've brought in the, the people, right? You've brought in that aspect that, that I think when you, you focus on commodities like silk or ceramic or so forth, you know, it gets lost. Of course, you know, it takes people to, to, um, uh, to, to, to do this. And I think, you know, ending with a slide like this on quarantines and so forth and thinking about the impact that um, COVID-19 has had actually, I see Tim Winters ask a question and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna quote from him. He, you know, he talked a few weeks ago that actually, you know, when the people to people contact breaks down, which has happened with COVID, everything stops, right? That's, that's when, you know, uh, all of our global networks, all of the interactions and so forth that has become so common. Once we can't have those people to people contacts, you know, then this is when, you know, everything sort of, maybe it falls apart, but you know, it, things have, it, it's really challenged the way in which um, we have to think about the world today and its interconnectivity and, and things like new global Silk Roads, right? I mean, there is a question, of course, about uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and, and how that's been linked to uh, floating cosmopolitan or to the Maritime Silk Road and the Overland Silk Road. I wonder, would you want to talk about that a little bit? Is that something that, you know, how, how, was, how does this play into it? <laughs> The COVID, um, commodities are moving around. Uh, ships are carrying goods from one place to another. So if you look at uh, the recent uh, revival of, of COVID in Hong Kong, uh, this may be related to uh, uh, sailors and, and dock workers. Right. In Singapore uh, as well, there was a case. Singapore as well. So you see that uh, maybe uh, the cruise ships are not uh, going along that much, but clearly uh, you can see even, I mean, there are two important things that came about which relate to floating cosmopolitanism and COVID. One is this transmission of diseases that uh, is still taking place because commodities are moving and ships are moving from one port city to another. Flights may have stopped uh, and that, that is the key aspect of moving around passengers today. But commodities still travel on, on ships and, and they are people working on the ships uh, and, and they are transmitting diseases. They are continuing the cosmopolitan aspect of it. The second part that continues today, and, and this is a recent news about uh, how uh, they discovered that um, antibodies actually may have some kind of immunity was with regard to one of the boats that sailed with people who were infected with, uh, with COVID uh, and people who had antibodies. And, and it, it became clear, and this is news from last week, uh, that those who had antibodies didn't get the uh, virus again. So you see, uh, during the floating part of things, 
uh, the knowledge that is gained, the transmission of diseases that happens are still irrelevant, right? right. So I think just to answer Tim's question, perhaps, uh, yeah, there aren't many people traveling, but you know, the cruise ships are also resuming uh, again. Uh, so again, um, these are examples of how floating cosmopolitanism has an impact on today's world. So that's, that's uh, uh, to uh, answer the question there, but also right. uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the Maritime Silk Road, maybe a convenient way uh, of designated this, uh, if you have that on your conference uh, uh, brochure or, or your book, um, it sells well. Uh, but uh, I think uh, as academics and scholars, uh, we should start the first paragraph by saying, I caution the idea of Maritime Silk Road. Uh, it may sound nice, but perhaps it does not really tell us everything about the Indian Ocean. Uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, sounds really good, uh, but uh, uh, we have to be uh, cautious about uh, the implications, the environmental impl implications uh, on coastal environments. Um, so I, I think it sounds good. It, it's good for the publishers, but my question is, is it good for the academics? Right, I think, you know, it's it's got, it's, there's, there's potential in it, but then there's also uh, pitfalls. But I think I just want to, because we're, we're, we've got about 10 minutes left and I just want to address some of the other questions that have come up. Um, one, one question that I had that actually Barbara, who is, um, has asked it as well in a similar way, is, is then how, how do we, the ports are essential, right? So, so how do we reconnect, or how do we connect what's happening on the, uh, on the sea, on the oceans, with what's happening on the ports, because the, this is the ports are the contact zones. I mean, Barbara asks, you know, about um, people who made these sea journeys possible, right? So investors, brokers, uh, other secondary sources. Also, Marina had uh, has an interesting proposition that I, I didn't see before, where she, you know, she says if ACM were to create a curate a, a um, a concept of floating cosmopolitanism uh, as opposed to the Maritime Silk Road. We kind of did, as Kenny has pointed out to me, you know, we did a show, uh, an exhibition uh, called Port Cities um, a few years ago where we, you know, we did actually look at the, exactly what you're, you're saying is sort of the cosmopolitanism that existed in ports. And we looked at some of the darker side as well. But I guess one thing that was perhaps missing from that show was, was that we didn't connect it to what's happening on, on, on sea, right? We, th so there's, again, this is one thing that we see in, in, in scholarship and in literature and in, in, in museums as well as sometimes we talk about the ports and what's happening there, but we don't get to the, the sea and maybe with your floating cosmopolitanism concept then, um, how do you then tie it back to, you know, what's the kind of dynamic or the interchange that, that's happening between the cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism on sea and the cosmopolitanism of these port cities. Yeah, I, I think this is why the plural form of cosmopolitanism is important. There are different forms of cosmopolitanisms. So I think I would call that port city cosmopolitanism, which is different from uh, interland cosmopolitanism, right? Uh, and, and floating cosmopolitanism would be another form of it. I'm not saying that port cities are not, not important. Uh, I think port cities are also important, but it's a different form of cosmopolitanism. The political factor in port cities or lack of political involvement, uh, the conflicts that uh, exist in port cities are perhaps different uh, from what happens on the ships. Uh, so I think uh, if we use the term uh, in, in plural form, we can say, of course, the port cities are important. Uh, the hinterland cities are also important because right. they are connected to port They're cities. They're the ones that connect, yeah. Right, right. So, so I think uh, my idea was to also say that ships are also important things to look at and what happened on the ships. A lot has been done on port cities. We have a project at NYU Shanghai that looks at the internal workings and external connections of port cities. You came for the conference that we did there. Mm. Um, but uh, I remember, you know, the first uh, Belitung exhibition that happened in Singapore happened at the Science Museum right. uh, before ACM. And they had actually created the ocean on which the commodities actually floated, right? That's so that true. was they had done a the, that also have in the background. was was, <laughs> was a much more, I guess, an immersive way of doing it. You know, to try and uh, 
exactly it's a sort of experiential that that people feel like they're they're floating which i guess is, is one solution you know um maybe just before we wrap up there's an, one or two other questions i just want to try and get that people have asked um eva's question is interesting it it kind of gets back to gender and women as well. She says, I'm wondering about short-term marriages with local women as described in Ivan Butata and others. Um, it brings cosmopolitan human connectivity and genes as lasting, lastingly significant substance into the discussion. So I guess here, you know, of course in Singapore, we could think of the Peranakan communities or, you know, you have the Cape Malays in, in, uh, in South Africa and so forth. So again, uh, this this mixing of of uh, mixing of of, uh, of races or mixing of peoples, you know, how does how does that play into your your concept as well? Certainly, I mean, again, this is where Amitabh Ghosh's Ibis trilogy uh, really matters, and even um, the endangered labor as they traveled. Uh, it's fascinating stories about how people actually met on the ships. Right. So I was looking at how the Chinese and Indians met on the endangered ships uh, and they uh, had friendships, uh, they had uh, marriages uh, that took place uh, on, on the ships and, and as they landed on the sugar plantations. Uh, so it's, it's a meeting of new people. It's not just uh, people meeting in the port cities, having a family and then traveling, but actually meetings for the first time. Uh, and this is about Chinese Hakka migrants uh, and from Calcutta, Hakka migrants, uh, Chinese living in Calcutta, traveling with Bengali uh, endangered laborers uh, together from Calcutta uh, to Africa uh, on endangered ships and what kind of relationship that happened uh, uh, on those ships and as they landed, how they created a family. So things happen on the ship and, and continue on, on the port cities. So I, I think that's, uh, that's an important uh, aspect of this floating cosmopolitanism when the meetings actually takes place on the ship mm -hmm. of people who did not know each other before they actually got onto the ships. Right. Okay. I think we have time for one last question, and I think I'll I'll, I'll wrap it up with I'm going to ask you the tricky one. Uh, by oops, where's it gone? It just disappeared from me. I think Avakul asked. Um, you know, oh, there we are. Would you say it is clearly time to jettison the term Silk Road of the Sea now, for all the reasons and lack of evidence of silk uh, on ships? Who will make this decision? Uh, maybe this this conference will uh, go some way to uh, to um, to doing that. I think maybe just. I, for me, I think, you know, uh, it's not that silk wasn't there. I mean, it clearly was, and, and, and silk was clearly being traded. Um, I think maybe one of the issues, of course, is silk is a perishable material. So, you know, obviously it doesn't survive underwater where, where ceramics, of course, will, and, and, and metals and so forth. So maybe tonight we have been a little... Maybe we've been a little bit guilty of, of downplaying silk because of course, like, like you said, right at the start of your presentation, when you looked at, at the Chinese scholars that that had first proposed this route. I mean, they, there was, you know, and, and the interactions with, with Japan and, and Korea, of course, we know that, that silk is a, such an important commodity that they were trading um, between those regions. Um, so it's not that silk wasn't there and it's not that the Silk Road is, is a complete misnomer, but for me, maybe it's just that it's, maybe it's been overemphasized a bit. You know, I, I, we speculate that there was silk on the belt and shipwreck, but of course it doesn't survive. So I don't know, just maybe to wrap things up, uh, what's your take on that? How, how do so, we move forward with this? So I'm writing an article called Against Silk Roads. Okay, um, there we are. <laughs> right, so, so I, I won't be the decider, but I'll be proposing that. Uh, but you know, the, the term is so popular uh, it's very difficult to get rid. Uh, what I would say that uh, you are absolutely right that silk did exist as an important commodity. I think we should do more research on the volume if we can find out uh, the nature because silk was not only traded but also gifted uh, to people uh, by Chinese envoys as well. Right. Uh, but, but it should not come at the discount of other commodities. Uh, some may be luxury commodities, some may not be luxury commodities. Uh, that were traveling, uh, daily necessities, rice, sugar, and other things uh, that were also transported in large quantities in bulk goods uh, were also important. So I, I think the reason I, I emphasize um, that we should think about uh, terms other than the Silk Road or the Maritime Silk Road is to not de-emphasize the importance of other commodities, but in particular, people who traveled on 
uh, on, on the ships uh, and travel across the Indian Ocean because their stories are equally important as the stories of commodities. Right, yeah, I would completely agree with that. I look forward to, uh, look forward to reading your article, um, Watch This Space. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it's something that hopefully over the course of the next two days, you know, the, the different panel presenters can, you know, you can, you can drill down a bit deeper into, um, into all of the topics really that have come up tonight. Um, I think, you know, again, I'm so just very thankful for to Tan Sen Sen. Thank you for, for really taking us through it. I think it's, you know, touched on so many points that, that hopefully like, over the course of the next few days, we can we can discuss further. Um, sorry, I didn't get a chance to um, to pose everybody's question tonight, but hopefully, again, you will be part of the uh, panels over the next four days, and we can keep this discussion going uh, for then. So yeah, on that note, I would just again like to thank you, um, Dr. Chan Sen Sen, and I'll hand back to Lester at this point. Thank you. So Stephen, can I yep. say that if, uh, yep. if people want to? Uh, uh, want to have any questions, they can write to me. Uh, I think my email address is somewhere there. You can Google. Uh, Absolutely. I'll be happy, can... to, uh, happy to respond because we didn't really have time to answer all the questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's very generous of you. We can, um, we can maybe put that around on the chat or on the tomorrow or, or even um, on one of the email links if, if you're okay with your, uh, your email being distributed. Great, so thank said, you. I'm very developing this concept and, and I would uh, really appreciate any feedback people would have. I know there are leading scholars uh, present uh, at, at this conference and I would appreciate their uh, suggestions and comments and of course criticisms as well. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Murphy and Dr. Sen. Well, I'm sure all of you can all agree with me. That was uh, certainly a wonderful discussion. A lot of great questions from you guys as well uh, in the Q&A section. Uh, so please keep it up. Um, as Dr. Murphy said, tomorrow and the day after, we hope to dive into uh, the topic even deeper. All right. So this unfortunately marks the end of day one. Such a fruitful discussion. Once again, uh, sincere appreciation to both Dr. Sen and Dr. Murphy for their wonderful discussion. Now, I just want to do a bit of logistics here. Now,